because you know, like it's so tempting to be so binary. Like, oh, it's so tempting, right? Like that's bad, and you know, I don't know what's good because there there really hasn't been an alternative yet. Um, but but we are just going to have to do the very like messy work of like being inside that system and disrupting it by asking hard questions and yeah. creating new systems inside of it, right? I mean, I think there are just there are a lot of like amazing disruptors who have come up in the yoga and the wellness world who really are challenging us to do better. Hey everyone, I'm Thais Sky. Welcome to Reclaim, a podcast for women by women on conversations that matter. Hello, hello, everybody. Tay Sky here. This is Reclaim the Podcast, where every week I bring to you conversations that matter. And, well, here's another conversation. This one is with Carrie Kelly, and you are in for a treat. And I know I say that after every guest, but come on. The guests that I have are so incredibly awesome, and Carrie Kelly is no exception. But first, before I bring her on, I just have to say... Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who have supported my Patreon in the past couple weeks and months. I appreciate you endlessly. Also, all of you who have interacted with me on Instagram and Facebook, sent me messages, asked me to talk about things, you know, reached out and shared how much this podcast has meant to you. I read every message. I appreciate every message. It really means the world to me when I hear from you that the things that I'm talking about on the podcast are resonating with you. I'm just endlessly grateful. Thank you so much for being such a rad community and for really rallying around this podcast and sharing with the world how much this podcast has touched you and, and meant to you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited because Today, the day of this podcast release, I am officially moving into my new place after being nomadic for about six weeks. Eh, not as impressive as maybe nomadic for five years or even five months, but six weeks felt like a really long time for me. Someone who has moved around so much in her childhood that it's almost become a trauma experience. <laughs> in many ways, moving in my childhood was a traumatic experience. And so being nomadic brought up so much for me that I'm going to be continuing to share in my little series that are all about transitions and taking leaps. I recorded an episode uh, last week called How Do You Know When to Move On? That released on Friday, so you can check that out. And then I will probably release another one later this week. So stay tuned. If you are in transition in any capacity, these episodes are meant to really support you and to help you navigate the uncomfortable terrains of uncertainty. One more quick thing before I bring Carrie Kelly on, I am taking on new one-on-one -on -one clients in the coming months. So if you are someone who has been navigating the worthiness wound and you're noticing how the feelings of an unworthiness, the feelings of inadequacy are really keeping you feeling stuck, feeling like you're running the same patterns over and over again, feeling like you just can't seem to break through and make the changes you want to make in your life. I invite you to reach out and consider working with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The way it would look like is um, I will send you to my website for you to look learn more about my work. And if what you read feels really good, you'll just click the contact me button. We'll set up a time to get on a call together and I listen to your stories and I ask questions and I gain clarity and what it is exactly that you need. And if it feels like something that I can support you with, then we'll talk about what that looks like. Um, everything th that you need to know about my one-on-one -on -one coaching is available at taissky.com forward slash coaching, including my pricing and my uh, the structure of the one-on-one -on -one work. So you can learn all about that at tayskycom forward slash coaching. The results that the clients that I've worked with have gotten are just so tremendously inspiring. I mean, the women who do this work, who do the shadow work, who want to access their emotions on a deeper level, who want to truly practice embodiment and speaking their truth and taking up space, what they end up finding when they do this work is that they feel more liberated. They feel more joyful. They feel freer, freer to be who they were born to be. Our work together is really a, the work of unlearning, removing the layers of indoctrination of beliefs and patterns that we've been taught to keep us safe, to keep us um, feeling small but safe. And we slowly expand our container. 
So again, if you're interested in learning more about working one-on-one with me, I am taking on a few more clients in the next couple months. You can learn more at thaissky.com forward slash coaching. And I look forward to hearing from you and seeing how I can support you take up more space in your life. Okay, let's talk about Carrie Kelly. I met Carrie Kelly at the Yoga Service Council Conference. I believe it was 2012 or 2013. And at that time, I was not awakened to social justice. um, But I was there representing a nonprofit uh, yoga organization called Sprout Yoga, which was Yoga for Eating Disorders. And I got to meet some pretty amazing people at this conference, including Carrie Kelly. And the minute I met her, I was just so blown away and impressed by her clarity and just her power and her focus. She is uh, really dear friends with Sean Korn and um, does a lot of work um, at Off the Mat into the into the world, an organization that helps um, the yoga community rally around social change. And now she runs her own nonprofit called Citizen Well. Well, actually, let me just read you her bio. So Carrie is the founder of Citizen Well, a movement to mobilize the well-being community into a powerful force for change. Her work was sparked by 9-11 when she lost her stepdad, a fireman, in the towers. She quickly discovered the power of mindfulness, not just as a tool for personal healing, but as a catalyst for collective change. Since then, Carrie has worked passionately to empower individuals, organize communities, and fight for justice and well-being. Carrie is a yoga teacher, coach, and change agent, and is recognized across communities for her inspired work to bridge transformational practice with social change and politics. She's been instrumental in translating the tools of well-being into practical application and social action in the public sector, working in collaboration with community organizers, spiritual leaders, and policymakers. She sees public health as a civil rights issue and is committed to democratizing well-being for all people. So you can learn more about her organization, Citizen Well, at www.ctzncitizenwell.org. I know that you're going to really dig this conversation with Carrie Kelly. We traverse so many topics from finding the intersection of healing and justice to yoga and navigating it consciously to what it really means to be well. We address the low vibes argument um, and perfectionism and self-care and basically how to activate change in our collective wellness. While you're listening to this episode, I want you to be thinking about your own relationship with healing and justice. Do you see them as separate or do you see them as the same? Why do you view it separate? How are they the same? And what are some ways that you can use your healing to activate justice in the greater community? Right. Carrie Kelly, hi. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. I'm so excited that you are here. I'm so excited to be here. It has been, I think, what, six years since we met in person? A lifetime, actually. Six yeah. years ago, I was married. I lived in California. <laughs> and now I'm divorced. I live in New York. Long time. Wow. Yeah. Big changes. Mm-hmm. Um, so for people who are not familiar with you and your work, tell, tell us a little bit about you. Oh my gosh. Um, (laughs) Like the Cliff Notes version. Yeah, something like that. I just had my 43rd birthday. So I feel um, I'm like reflecting on how many lives I've lived. I lived um, a corporate America, like pretty traditional, predictable, like white girl from the suburbs life for 25 years. So there was that life. Um, And then 9-11 happened and I lost my stepdad, um, Mm. who is a fireman. And that, as you can imagine... Um, catapulted me into a whole other life, which became my my life of healing and social change. Um, And completely unexpected, um, but yoga was really the place where I I landed after 9-11 and I sort of fell apart and fell back together again. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I just am very attracted, like magnetized by you and your work is how you have found that intersection of healing and social change. Yeah. Yeah. Because for me, the way that I found yoga, it was never separate from the, the political, um, from the social justice, right? Because I, I found it in a moment where I was becoming 
aware of, of the world beyond my bubble, right? Like 9-11 like dropped on my doorstep and I, co- I actually couldn't for another second ignore what was happening around the world. Like the world actually came to Manhattan yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and kind of like took apart my life as I had known it until that moment. And so for me, the yoga had always been um, intertwined with my 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 relentless quest to understand what was happening in the world and what my relationship was with the world. And so it was never really for me like an individual um, path, although that was there for me. Like yoga was the, was the, the journey towards healing after 9-11, but it was just so much more complex with me for me because it included all of this other stuff, right? It included really trying to understand how we got here. It included having to actually unlearn all of the things that I had been taught when I was young about what was safe, um, what was true, <laughs> um, what was real, what was American, um, and really forged a whole different path for myself. So that was the thing that actually um, got me to where I am today. But it was a long and messy journey of really having to unravel um, all, all of the ways in which I had been conditioned, right, in, in sort of like my white, um, um, you know, female, um, suburban, capitalist culture, um, and really trust a whole new path, um, both, both on the mat and off the mat. Um, and so I'm grateful that that those things that that intersection existed for me from the beginning because it really helped me not just like um, really lean hard into the relationship between yoga and social change, which is why I met you and why I really fell into the work of off the mat into the world. But it but it really um, um, it revealed a way of being in the world that allowed me to be not just connected to like the deepest part of myself, mm. but, but connected to like the true, the hard truths um, and the reality that we were living in and that we are still today. I just, I'm one, I, I'm so curious about then how you've been navigating the yoga world and staying sane in the bubble of yoga that is so, so about being a privileged kind of small bubble world like the amount of patience I just don't I just need to know how you do it like how do you do it well it's 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 a conflict right because when I think back to my yoga journey um I can I, I can be really grateful I mean I have to be right like it really did I know it's like dramatic to be like yoga saved my life, but it really did. Like up until that point, my life was a lie, (laughs) right? Like I was doing the thing I I was supposed to do. I had drank the Kool-Aid. Like I, you know, and I like, I did, I did, like I had all the checks on the boxes according to the way I was supposed to live my life. So yoga really disrupted that for me and, and, um, and helped me find my truth um, helped me heal, helped me navigate like an impossible moment, uh, which was 9-11 um, and my divorce, like, and all of the moments I've had in my life where I've, you know, where I've, um, where I've lost myself, where I've lost my ground, where I've lost my identity. Like yoga has been the con- like, like the constant friend, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the unconditional lover. Um, so I, I, I have that part of my practice. Um, and yeah, and I have a lot of um, uh, frustration. I have judgment, you know, that's like, you know, dirty and not cool. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> right? Like, like, I was just having a conversation with my friend this morning about goop. Like, I have, I have thoughts. I have feelings about goop. <laughs> and what goop is doing to the wellness world and to like our culture as a whole and our relationship with what it means to be well and who gets to be well and who doesn't. Right. So like I have all of these unhealthy, unyogic feelings about, um, about kind of the yoga bubble, the yoga culture that you're describing. Um, but it is a paradox for me because I, I have the part of me that is so grateful. Um, and I have the part of me that is so fucking annoyed. Um, and, and annoyed pre- predominantly because I feel like we're missing this enormous opportunity to like live our lives through the lens of our practice, which calls us to just do so much more, to see so much clearer, right? Mm -hmm. To feel so much deeper, um, to go so much further into, um, 
into the shadow of what it is to be alive in America today. And so I, I, I think that's really like the source of my, my frustration um, around kind of the bubble that you're naming is that um, there, there's so much more um, that we can be doing because of the practice, because of, of what it calls us to, um, to embody and who it calls us to be in relationship to one another. And we're not doing it, right? Because we're so obsessed with our own individual um, selves that um, we refuse to pick our head up and see what's actually actually going on around us. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that the phrase like, um, take your practice off the mat is a very popular phrase, but what that ends up looking like for most of us, or at least it looked like for me was, Oh, I just take a deep breath, you know, throughout my day, which, Hey, can be life changing. I am not minimizing the power of a good deep breath, but at what point do we have to just be honest with ourselves that there's so much more that that means beyond just being a little bit nicer, you know, in our nine to five job. Yeah. You know, like the, um, the breath is really important. Um, and I'll tell, and the embodiment, the feeling is really important. And, and to say that it's not a revolutionary act in and of itself is actually not true, right. In a, in a culture and in a system that is designed um, to separate us from ourselves, to mm-hmm. numb us out, to distract yes. us, um, to convince us that we are separate and not interdependent um, is actually radical and revolutionary. So when yeah. we reclaim our bodies, when we reclaim our breath, when we reclaim relationship, we really are doing the work of like of, of radical revolutionary change. And mm-hmm. and there's an and. Mm-hmm. Um, when we don't remember that our well-being is bound up with other folks, like when we think that it's just enough to hit our mat, to meditate every day, to drink a green juice, to drive our hybrid, to give to a charity here and that there as like our, um, as our citizen duty, right. As our, our commitment to wellness fulfilled, um, then we miss out on like the whole truth of, yes. of what's happening all around us. So to me like that, and that is the truth of yoga, right? Yoga is to yoke, it's union. It affirms the the interdependence of our existence. And so when we start to understand that for ourselves, that that I can't be well unless you are well, that my well-being is impacted, even as like a white woman, um, by the structural racism that has plagued our country for over 400 years. Like when I realize that, then actually I can have the fullest experience of yoga, the fullest experience of wellness and of well-being and what it is to be alive um, and in my full purpose and potential in the world. But we forget that. And part of why we forget that is because we live in a culture of, of, of individualism, right? That, that encourages us to fend for ourselves, that says it's enough to have personal responsibility, to take responsibility for ourselves, for our finances, for our careers, for our health and our bodies. And as long as we do that, that's enough. And it's not, it's just not enough. And we know that now, right? Because um, it's really coming to a head in our country that we just aren't well. Collectively, we are not well. Um, Poverty, you know, whether you can look at any statistic in our country, child welfare, poverty, family separation, um, black and brown boys being killed by law enforcement, um, you know, Roe is about to be revoked unless we prevent, you know, Kavanaugh from being appointed. And so there is so much at stake that is essential to our collective well-being. Um, so much so that like when we buy into the myth that our well-being of, of like the well-being of me or that our well-being is individuated um, and individual and isolated from other people, we are actually complicit in upholding the systems of oppression that, that keep people unwell. And so I just like for me, like my journey, um, you know, you're like, tell me how you got here. It just became like so intolerant for me mm-hmm. um, in my own like quest for truth and in my own seeking of wellness um, to turn my back on that. And so now like I, like this, you know, my political um, passion, um, my, you know, my commitment to love and justice is a reflection of my wellness practice. I think it is as important as hitting the mat, as taking that breath, um, as, you know, sitting on my cushion, 
as uh, drinking, um, you know, health and eating healthy food. Um, it's as important as taking care of the environment um, because we just can't move forward when some of us get to be well and everyone else gets left, be- left behind. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to, I have a feeling I know the answer. I have a feeling I know this very well, but um, what is your response to people who say, you know, but politics, it's low vibes, you know, like talking about racism and and these are just like so negative and I just, I want to be a positive person and I don't have the capacity to like read all these news and then I get so hopeless. And so I just rather not be in that low vibe state and just focus in my own life. Mm -hmm. Well, look, first I'll say that um, I get how overwhelming it is to be alive right now and to be paying attention. Because when you pay attention for real, for real, um, it's a fucking mess out there. Mm -hmm. And so like I get the human condition that wants to numb Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, consume substances and shop um, and, you know, and even like overwork out and overwhelm myself, right? Like I totally get that impulse in a world that feels like it's going totally insane yeah. um, and is collapsing around us. So I, I, I get that. Um, and I just, I just want to name that because I don't think that's unreasonable given what's at stake and what's happening in our world right now. And there is nothing high vibe about denying people's existence. There is nothing Mm -hmm. high vibe about turning away from the degradation of our planet. There is nothing high vibe about children being ripped from their families. Like, I just don't know what the definition of high vibe or positive (laughs) vibe is. That makes that okay. And so it's totally, totally absurd. It's a complete spiritual bypass to assume that you can transcend the truth of our existence by going into some like isolated or insulated state that keeps you separated from what's Mm -hmm. really happening that you can't like you, you can't separate yourself, you know, from, I mean, unless you like move to some Island and live off the land in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I guess that's a possibility, but like if you live in this country and I'm assuming most of your listeners are American, even if you don't, you know, you're, you're, you're most likely operating in a system, participating in that system, investing in that system, contributing yeah. to that system, whether you like it or not. So you have to actually exist in that, that contradiction that you want to like disrupt the system and transform it mm-hmm. um, and shut it down, right? Like whatever your, your stance is and simultaneously you're upholding it. <laughs> yeah, And that, that's a like, mind fuck. Yeah. And to me, the yoga, where the yoga is most valuable, especially in this moment, and this is where it's really come in handy for me, is that yoga helps us build an inner capacity to show up in the face of that complexity, Mm. right? To show up um, in in that contradiction, right? That like we're both trying to like tear it down and we exist inside of it. Yeah. Um, that we can reject it and we also have to like take responsibility that we're still in it. We're contributing to it. And that's hard. I think that's a hard paradox for us to, um, to contend with and to reckon with. But the yoga actually allows us to hold paradox and contradiction and tension and complexity. And that to me, that building that muscle through yoga, through the, the embodied experience of yoga on the mat actually allows us to apply it I'm out in the world where things are just really messy Mm -hmm. and and it's hard to wrap our heads around it and we're overwhelmed, but you know what? Like we can show up anyway. We hit the mat anyway. We take the breath anyway. We lean in anyway, even when we're scared, even when it's hard and that's the practice, right? And so like who better than we, those of us that are predisposed to this practice, um, who better than we to show up? Mm -hmm. And to lean in and to get engaged and to have hard conversations and to hit the streets and to vote our values. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the paradoxes that I've been confronting, particularly in yoga, is capitalism and yoga. I mean, this isn't a new conversation. It's been have it's been a conversation for a long time, but how do we at the same time, you know, wear the Lululemons and spend hundreds of dollars on Manduka mats and 
you know, we go to these yoga festivals that are just filled with products of all sorts of white women culturally appropriating um, religious symbols for a huge profit, right? Like how do we navigate that? Having to go through that just to get to the practice. Yep, yep. And, and more and more yoga studios are selling products as their storefront as a way to make more money um, because yoga studios aren't making money. And so it's just, that's something that I've been sitting with. Yeah. It's really, I mean, that's, that's another one of those paradoxes, right? Like um, in the near future, I don't see the wellness community operating outside of capitalism. Yeah. Um, right. That's just like sort of how things work right now. And that's not to say it's right. And that's not to say it's not the source of like so much fucked up shit. Yeah. Um, but I think like we can exist inside that system and ask hard questions around, around cultural appropriation, Yeah, right? We can ask important questions around exploitation, right? Like, Mm -hmm. um, how are we selling services, um, on the backs of folks, you know, from whom those practices originated? Um, how are we creating, uh, environments that are radically inclusive so that people don't feel excluded or so that it's not, you know, um, not accessible for them. So I I think that like there's nuance to the way in which we can be navigating those waters that, that, um, I, cause you know, like it's so tempting to be so binary, like, Oh, it's so tempting, right? Like that's bad. And you know, I don't know what's good because there's, there really hasn't been an alternative yet. Um, but, but we're just going to have to do the very like messy work of like being inside that system and disrupting it by asking hard questions and yeah. creating new systems inside of it, right? I mean, I think there are just there are a lot of like amazing disruptors who have come up in the yoga and the wellness world who really are challenging us to do better. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's as white folks or white women, whether it's as um, yoga studios that are trying to be more inclusive mm-hmm. um, and more welcoming, whether it's like brands like Lululemon and Manduka and Wanderlust, right? That um, that believe in creating a culture of collective wellness, right? But that may not be going all the way in way, you know, in, in, in how they're creating the conditions for that. Right. I think that like, can we be um, authentic and honest, like brutally honest about like where we are and um, as like a whole wellness industry and the fact that like we can do a lot better. I don't even think it's like what's wrong and what's right. I think it's what's better. Mm. Um, you know, and not in ways that replicate systems. I think often we do that or we, or we do things for show, right? Like we, we do charity for show because it makes us feel good or it makes us look good. But I mean, like, like what does it look like to ask hard questions of ourselves, whether we're leaders, nonprofits, corporations, um, um, spiritual teachers, right? Like how do we take responsibility for our, um, our contribution and our participation and the ways in which, um, whether it's our voices, our platforms, our policies are actually perpetuating systems of oppression. And, and to me, and I don't, I don't hold myself because like, I'm definitely not perfect. Um, and I live in like, I live in like white skin, right? So I like, I'm going to be like unlearning white supremacy my whole life. So I don't like have any, um, assumption that I'm going to graduate to some transcended state of like pure consciousness, um, and get some gold star. Like I get that I'm going to be doing this work for the rest of my life. And, and just when I answer a hard question about my existence and about my responsibility, I'm going to be called to answer a deeper one. Yeah. And so to me, like, I, I think that um, what I want for like the, the leaders of this culture, the people with influence and reach um, and leverage is um, for them to actually like step into the hot seat and ask hard questions um, and, and challenge themselves in the way in which they can move the needle. And I think we as like a consumer culture um, need to like be, I don't want to say it need to be patient and I don't want to see need to be palatable because, you know, we're, um, we're in 80 million, uh, we're, in, we're 80 million people in the U S and I think like a $300 billion industry. Wow. Which is a lot of spending power. Yeah. So like, so I actually think, um, if we got organized, we could actually pressure companies in particular to do more and to move faster. And I also think as a culture and a community that we need to be okay with the fact that people aren't going to go from zero to 80 Mm -hmm. and they're not going to become perfect overnight. Mm -hmm. Um, That's just not where we are in our existence right now. And so what does it look like to challenge, to disrupt, um, 
to, to lean in, to pressure um, ourselves and our leaders to do better and to ask harder questions and to take responsibility and simultaneously hold them with compassion and love, yeah. right? Like not tear them down, not chop their head off, not demonize or dehumanize them because that's just more of the same violence, mm. right? But actually like push them, be fierce, um, be challenging, um, be relentless, be committed in like, like fighting for the values, the embodiment of the values that we stand for and that we name as representative of yoga and wellness culture um, and, and also be walking with them as they make those shifts and as yeah. they transform themselves from, from the inside out. And so um, I'm not letting anyone off the hook. I think we have a really long way to go um, and, um, and we all have a part, a part in this. But I do think that the idea that someone's going to be perfect overnight or, or going to become right or, you know, is just like ridiculous. Like, like what, are, what are other metrics that we can um, acknowledge or celebrate um, that are an indication that folks are moving in the right direction? And then how do we hold them accountable to that? Right. Yeah. The same way that we need to hold our political leaders accountable. Right. How do we hold ourselves accountable? How do we hold our leaders accountable to what they're saying, to what they're promising um, and to and to where they need to be so that so that we can so that we can like lessen the harm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it's like that's where we got to be like invested in right now is like, yeah. how do we lessen the harm? Yeah. Um, and our, how do we um, divest, quite frankly, um, from the wellness practices, the wellness policies, the wellness companies um, that that are not only contributing to um, systems of oppression or replicating them, but that aren't actually doing the work to try and change themselves. Mm -hmm. And I am seeing some companies try to do that. Yeah, yeah, I am seeing it too. I'm curious how you have navigated or how you support other people in navigating the guilt and the shame that is often a part of this conversation, you know, cause we come in and we say, this is, this is the vision. And then the immediate response is okay, but I'm just a white, a white woman who wants to do yoga. And are you telling me that I, I can't enjoy yoga? And then there's often so much shame and guilt associated um, with the cognitive dissonance of what we're asking people to do. And I would love to hear how you've navigated or how you support others in navigating that. Well, I mean, I start by just telling my own story of shame. I mean, yeah. like, like I, you know, I was like a perfect specimen. <laughs> At 25, you know, I was like a perfect specimen, white woman, completely clueless and totally invested um, in, in a, a white supremacist um, yeah. culture. And, uh, so I was really indoctrinated. So I, I start there. Like I, like I might have more words now, more vocabulary, more understanding, more consciousness, but I a, have a long way to go and it's been a long journey to get here. And it wasn't that long ago, um, that I was fucking shit up all over the place and I had no clue. Right. Mm -hmm. It also wasn't that long ago that I had very good intentions and I wasn't making a very good impact mm -hmm. that even like even in the yoga service world, right, um, the way that I was showing up was actually replicating behaviors um, and, and a culture of um, supremacy, oppression, whiteness, and so on and so forth. So, so I, I start like by actually just like sort of gutting myself vulnerably yeah. and talking about my own journey because it hasn't been a clean one or an easy one. It's been messy and complex and humiliating and confronting. Yeah. And I survived. And I've actually come a long way, you know? Yeah. So, so that's a part of it is like, what does it look like for us to have courageous conversations with one another about like this journey, about what it feels like, about what, 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 what we're afraid of, um, um, what, it, what it looks like to practice with one another, finding new words around racism, around misogyny. Um, and so that's part of it. Um, you know, and the other thing I would say is... Um, I think Reverend Angel said this to me that um, shame is actually um, a product of white supremacy because it exists to silence us and to shut us down. Mm. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, like I, I can't let this thing actually take over because that too 
is um, a replication of the system. Mm -hmm. And so it, it actually challenged me to be fierce with my feelings of shame and guilt and not, not compassionate. Like I, I can be kind um, with that part of me um, that didn't know with the part of me that's scared of like what the other side looks like with the part of me that's like petrified to make mistakes um, when I'm navigating like, you know, issues of social justice or communities um, on the margins. And so um, there are moments where I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to fuck up and make a mistake or offend someone or say the wrong thing. And I, and I really am trying to get more resilient mm -hmm. um, in, um, in making mistakes so that I can actually acclimate more quickly. Um, yeah. And I have a lot of allies in my life that are like really good at calling me up and yeah. not out not out. Um, so that's what I would say is like, um, 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 tell your story. Um, especially white women, like talk to other white women. Don't go to your like one black friend and ask them to like explain everything about racism to you <laughs> because you're finally ready to hear it. Like, don't do that. Right. Cause that just puts like a really unnecessary burden on the, on, the, on them, but rather like go to white folks that, you know, and have hard conversations and, and let it be messy and, and, and ask questions and, and say, I don't know when you don't know. And then be willing to like co-create a culture of mistake making, right. Um, uh, Mickey Scott Bay Jones calls it brave space, right? Brave space um, allows for mistakes, right? Brave space understands that we're all human and we're all doing the best that we can. And we're going to, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to impact each other. Um, but that's what it looks like to be in relationship and yeah. to be moving towards relationship yeah. and to be embodying practice. Right. And so like, what does that look like in culture? And I just, I think that that's so radical in a culture that like really rewards perfectionism, yes. you know, really like demands that we be perfect all the time. We say all the right things. And even ally culture replicates that, right? Ally culture, ally performative allyship is all about like saying the right thing and having the, the, the best moves. And I mean, you see that even on social media now that like, it's like the ally Olympics, you know, like who's going to say the most <laughs> woke thing. And, and to me, like, you know, if we're doing anything for exposure um, or if we benefit from it or if it's all about us like it's maybe really not authentically allyship yeah um, and so so to me it's like 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 be in authentic relationship with one another around leaning in and getting vulnerable and doing the work and the shame is going to come up and the guilt is going to come up and it's going to feel icky um, and gross the same way that like when we hit our mat and we're like sitting in that pigeon pose for 25 minutes in Sean Corn's class, we want to <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we're confronted with all that stuff, but we stay Yeah, and it changes. Mm -hmm. It's never permanent. Right. And this moment is not permanent. Right. And the shame is not permanent. Um, and so, um, so I think it's practice, you know, it's like, it's like the thing that we, we keep coming back to. It's like a practice of like being more authentic, being more honestly ourselves in every moment um, and not letting those masks drop in, right? Not letting the shields of shame and blame and, um, and the distraction and the numbing. It's just like drop it and, and show up for real. Yeah. And, um, and trust. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right. So what's a, what's a hard question that you've been navigating or that you've been asking? Honestly, um, it's a great question. I feel very confronted right now. <laughs> the question that I've been asking, especially since I've gotten into this work that's related to the question that you just asked me before, um, is why um, I'm so adverse to taking care of myself. Mm. You know, and um, the more that I've become aware and engaged in issues of, of social justice and liberation, um, the more I've really neglected my own well-being um, and my own like ability to thrive and maybe not like consciously, but that's sort of like happened. Um, like I feel so like in the in the movement and in the revolution um, that in many ways I've, I've really benched myself, um, mm. which I know to not be authentic to this practice, right? Because our well being is bound. So I need to be well in order to be in the game and to, and to play in the arena. 
Um, but there's something, and it might be the dismantling of my whiteness and my privilege. There's something to like where I am in my own, um, in my own evolution, uh, that has decided that my thriving is not good enough Mm. for this moment in our, um, in our country. And I'm really trying to unpack that and like understand like what is the belief that's underneath that, that, um, cause it's not always conscious, right. That causes me to make decisions, um, against my own well-being, um, and maybe for <laughs> the well-being of the whole. Um, yeah. But it's like, I mean, I've, it's cost me a lot, you know, it's, it's cost me a marriage. It's cost me, I broke my back in a bunch of different places. You know, it's cost me my, my physical health and, and, um, and well-being, you know, it's cost me financially, it's cost me relationships. Yeah. And so, um, so I, I'm really clear now that the price that I've paid for neglecting myself and for assuming that I don't get to be included in my own movement of well-being, um, is really a myth in and of itself and isn't serving me and isn't serving my work. And so that's sort of the question I'm holding constantly for myself is like, what does it look like to be fucking all in, to be the fiercest advocate, to be, you know, to be brave and courageous um, and um, to, and to allow for my own um, vitality to Mm. coexist with that. Yeah. And so that's been really, really confronting for me over the last couple of years. Yeah. And I feel like something that just popped into my mind, and I don't know if it's applicable to you, but it may be applicable to some people who are listening and who resonate with your experience, is that it's almost like, it's almost like a defense mechanism. Like if I don't take care of myself and I can't thrive and I can't really show up, then I'm off the hook. I'm off the hook from having to show up and mm-hmm. having to live my potential. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know. I think that there's something there to be said about the fear yeah. of our own potential. Yeah. I think that's really true. And I think, um, and I think what you're naming is, um, and I don't know if that's my thing, but I think that's really prevalent in wellness that um, there's a self-preservation behavior. Mm-hmm. I think especially for like, especially for white folks mm-hmm. um, um, who think, you know, I was having a conversation a couple weeks ago um, I think in Asheville at the Asheville yoga festival and someone was asking about, um, about self care and, and political work. Um, and that, and that, and they said that they felt, and, and, oh, and actually we were having a conversation. It was a white woman caucus around racism and they had said something around feeling like they needed to do the work for themselves first mm-hmm. and then, and then they'd be ready. And I was like, wouldn't that be nice? Mm-hmm. <sighs> that we had time for that Mm -hmm. and we don't. Right. So of course, like we want to be taking responsibility for like our own awareness, consciousness, well-being, capacity, courage. Um, but actually that has to happen simultaneously to us being like in full engagement, um, in the world around dismantling systems of racism and and getting politically active. And so I think to your point, there is a culture um, even in, even in yoga service, um, of, um, first we need to take care of ourselves and then we can be engaged in the world. And I actually don't agree with that. I think it's like, we need to take care of ourselves and we need to be engaged in the world at the same time. And that's messy shit, Mm -hmm. right? It's not like the perfect, like first I will perfect myself Mm -hmm. and then I can be of service. Um, so I think you're right. I think there's a behavior of self-preservation and, um, and isolation and, um, and protection there. Um, that's sort of like embedded in a wellness culture. And that's just, it's just a a, a lot more spiritual bypass. It's just, we have to get okay with the fact that like, um, all of this stuff is happening all together at the same time. And our personal and individual evolution and transformation is happening, um, simultaneous to the, to the collective, um, transformation of our communities and of our country. And it's tricky, but it's true. Yeah. I feel like self-care 
I just don't see people really knowing how to engage in it because you have the people who are like, I can't take care of myself because I have to focus on everything else. And I, there's so much going on, but the opposite end of the spectrum, the people that I think on first glance, we may think are really doing good at self-care. You know, they're the ones who are spending all the money on the massages and the yoga, and they have the privilege to have that. I don't think that they're actually engaging in self-care either because because I think it's coming from a wound of un, like an unworthiness. Um, so they're overcompensating by trying to take so good care of them. But you can't really take care of yourself if you're not aware mm-hmm. of, you know, the, uh, the others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, Barbara, um, Erin Reich wrote this amazing book called Natural Causes. She's actually written a million amazing books. Um, and, and, and she really calls out the culture, the, the kind of thing that you're naming, this sort of relentless pursuit of perfection. Yes. Like the like of, of health perfection. Yes. Yeah. Right. Of, and, and like even of diagnosis. And, and she even says like prevention, like our obsession with preventing the body's sort of natural evolution and aging. And um, is, she says it's really dangerous, right? And, it, and you can see how that too is like a product of our culture. Yes. Um, and, I, and all of that comes from a non-worthiness, right? Yeah. Like, like it, you know, it's, it's a constant compensation. I, I can't really speak for people who, I'm, who are doing self-care in different ways. I mean, what I'll say is I think that there's definitely um, a different role and a an, different perspective on self-care based on uh, where you're located in society. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you're right. For a lot of white folks, they use self-care as, um, as insulation. Mm-hmm. Um, and separation. But I also think that there are a lot of communities on the margins that use self-care as healing. And that's really, really, Absolutely. really necessary, right? So like, Hands down. So we, we talk about that a lot kind of in our, our community, in our culture, that self-care looks different for different people, not just based on their individual needs, but based on where they're located in society. Yeah. Um, and that means that we need to respond in different ways, right? Yeah. Um, um, whether we're, you know, um, you know, whether, you know, we're, we're, um, folks on the color or on the margins or, or being oppressed by the system or whether we benefit from it. Like yeah. our self-care regimen should look different because of that. Right. And we've been just using this concept lately of mutual care and mutual care get, says that you get to be well um, and your well-being is tied up in the well-being of the whole mm. and that you actually can't accomplish uh, self-care <laughs> to your point before um, if it's actually, um, if it neglects the well-being of other people. Right. Um, but it also says, and this is a really important thing that I need to keep reminding myself, that like your, your well-being gets to be included. Yes. That you don't, it's not a trade-off, that we all actually benefit, like we all rise when everyone gets to be well. Yeah. And that to me is like, you know, if we can sort of rewire our brain <laughs> out of scarcity and into abundance and really start to like see real that. abundance, real authentic abundance, not like yeah. the blah, 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 like, you know, um, you know, hippie dippy abundance, but like real human connection and abundance. Um, then I think we're going to just start to see things differently. We're going to understand our practice and its role in our life and in our thriving in a different way. And we're going to see the, the issues that we're swimming in, um, really as, um, as necessary to our own personal practice and to the practice that, you know, is going to move us forward as a collective. Yeah. I really hear that. So thank you for that. I think that that's very important distinction. And it's, it, again, it adds nuance to something that I think so many of us paint as like, so one thing. Yeah. Well, and we like, I, I didn't know that either. Right. Cause I look through white eyes. Right. So, you know, I also had this like, well, self-care is bullshit and I'm never going to use that word again. And I had a friend who's a woman of color, this incredible um, facilitator say, you know, that's from your perspective. Yeah. That's not true for everyone. And so like it taught me a lot about how our opinions, our perspectives, um, the stories that we tell, the ways in which we judge are often coming from our own. I think honestly, that's the biggest thing that I've awakened to as in my own journey of white, you know, of awakening to my own white privilege yeah. is just recognizing how much of my opinions and stories and things that I'm like a fighter for and I believe and I advocate are actually coming from a very particular lived experience and does not in any way, shape or form apply 
to all people. Everyone. Well, and it's why, you know, we often say that we really need to, um, um, you know, especially within the wellness culture, those of us who are white, we really need to be looking to the leadership of women of color or of um, folks on the margins because their their perspective, for me at least, feels much more like a prism. Like they can yes. see things from yes. so many different angles, and it's so much more inclusive yes. of the whole experience of being alive in America than the very limited experience um, that that us white privileged folks have had. Yeah. And so, you know, we benefit we gain from like leaning back and getting out of the way yes um from the leadership of of folks who are having a much more intersectional experience of being alive yeah i love that so what project are you really excited that you're working on right now oh my god so um in like two weeks we're doing this thing called citizen summit which we haven't done before so it's like consuming every like brain cell of my being i'm sure it every is every minute of my day <laughs> um but it's super exciting because you know we we were like you know we've always been sort of like operating at the intersection of of well-being and political engagement and this midterm you know november 6th is going to be perhaps one of the most significant elections of our lifetime. Yeah. Um, given that like every branch of government has been hijacked at this point. Yeah. Um, and, and as a community, and I know you know this, you know, we really just haven't been organized and coordinated. That's not to say we're not a community that's not, um, uh, you know, engaged in issues and outspoken and, um, and involved, but we're not organized. Like we're not actually aggregating our voices. We're not, um, uniting our feet on the street. We're not like uh, uh, um, organizing our collective votes in a specific direction that ref- that reflects our values. And so um, we are organizing this summit, um, which is basically, it's going to be in Boone, North Carolina. The theme is called, This is Our House. Mm. <laughs> um, speaking of the house, the one that, that's, uh, you know, over yes. there. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's really about reclaiming um, our role and responsibility in, in taking back our government um, and, and in taking back our liberation. And so we've got amazing speakers coming. Marianne Williamson is going to be there. Uh, Angel Kyoto Williams is going to be there. Sean Korn, Mickey Scott Bay Jones, Kareen Luck, Michelle Johnson, all these incredible people. And quite frankly, like everyone that's coming is a, like, in an, like in and of themselves is a presenter. And so we have just this like epic um, group of people coming. We have about 14 states coming with delegations. Wow. Um, which is super cool. And, and basically the experience is going to be a combination of shared practice and values. Like we're going to, we're going to practice together and we're going to have conversations about what is our shared culture, um, that unites us, right? Cause we're a lot of different people doing a lot of different things and we don't have to agree on everything. Um, but what are like, what, what can we center yeah. Um, as the thing that brings us together and what we can all fight for together. And then we're going to be doing skill building around creating brave space, around deep canvassing, around getting organized in our communities. Um, and then certainly we're going to be getting coordinated strategically on how we can take on um, this midterm season um, as leaders and as communities and as practitioners, right? As people yeah. who are really centering collective well being um, as um, the organizing principle of our political engagement. So I'm freaking terrified um, and totally excited about that. And um, I would say my most favorite thing, which I know you can resonate with this year, has been doing the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, Citizen Podcast has been like, you know, I, I, um, it's like I didn't give myself permission to have fun for like so long. And then I did that podcast and I was like, oh my God, I love this work so much. Like I love the work of getting to be in provocative, challenging, inspiring, um, deep conversations with um, uh, some of the most um, amazing people on the planet right now. And, and really unpack the theme of our podcast is really unpacking um, and understanding the relationship between well-being and political engagement. It's called Citizen and it's really all about like the practice of citizenship as analogous to like the practice of yoga. Like what does it look like to show up as a citizen of humanity every day and be like advocating um, and, and buying and speaking out as citizens for the well-being of everybody every day of our lives as culture and lifestyle. So it's been really fun and um, totally emergent and hard. it was scary. It's like the scariest thing I've done in like a decade. I love it. Well, I'll be sure to like add all of the links for people love it. to go check out. And the- I love your podcast. Like I was just like, it, like <laughs> honestly, like this, I'm so grateful that there are so many brave voices um, 
that are using this particular medium to have like courageous conversations and say the things that no one's saying and, and lean in and really center um, heart and uh, center practice and center humility and center compassion. So thank you. Thank you. for doing Oh, that. thank you. I yeah. appreciate you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. You're, you're a firehouse. Like you're just, just a little, Oh, I love it. I love your force in the world. I think the world is so much better because you're on it. And um, I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the same goes here. I'm so grateful that you are doing this. Thanks for being in the conversation with me and being in the world with me.